My guest today hosts one of my favorite shows on all of CBC Radio, but it's also one of the hardest to describe. And if you've ever found yourself in the difficult position, as I have, of trying to sum up to a friend the eclectic, eccentric magic that is Jonathan Goldstein's Wiretap, you'll know what I mean. Wiretap airs each Saturday at 3.30 p.m. on CBC Radio 1, and it's a program that eludes easy classification. It's an odd melding of different elements that somehow works and even makes sense in a way, although the reasons why aren't entirely clear. The show, which has been referred to facetiously as Liartap, is infamous for blending the line between fiction and reality. And as the listener, you're often left not quite sure what is real, what is the work of Goldstein's imagination, and what lies somewhere in between. Probably the signature element of the program, and certainly the one that I first fell in love with, are the fictionalized phone conversations that Jonathan has with his friends, Howard, Gregor, and Josh. Jonathan acting as the Jerry Seinfeld to the outlandish Cosmo Kramer antics of these likable, if often irrational, cast of characters. But although Wiretap will often leave you laughing, there's also many times at which the show puts the whimsy aside and takes on serious, even philosophical subject matter that will leave you thinking long after the program ends. But above all, whether it's serious or humorous, I think what ties the wiretap together is a propensity for understanding and reflecting on the absurdities of life, and both the struggles and irony that result from recognizing this fact. Although he's had much success in the medium, Jonathan Goldstein didn't originally set out to be in radio. His main creative passion for most of his life, maybe even today, has been writing. But as he was pursuing his writing, he eventually found himself into the world of radio, first doing pieces for CBC Radio, and then landing a summer show called Road.Trip. Afterwards, he spent several years working as a full-time producer for PRI's This American Life in New York City before coming back to Canada and starting Wiretap. Wiretap is currently in its 10th season. If you haven't already been won over, I definitely recommend you check it out. I sat down with Jonathan to ask him about his life as a writer, his journey in public radio, and the advantages and drawbacks of looking at life with an outsider's perspective. Here's our conversation. Your show Wiretap is this really eclectic mix of, of different things that sort of blur fiction and reality. Um, you have these plausibly real but absurd conversations with your friends over the phone where they're always getting into different, uh, proposing different random ideas. or, or different, getting, different pickles Yes, that they get into. And um, on the other hand, there's these real conversations with sort of real life, almost absurd or eccentric characters, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I was wondering, how, how do you actually see the show? Do, is there a unifying theme to it that, that you view it as? Or is it just sort of your vessel to explore things you're interested in? Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's I, and both both sides of the, the things that you describe interest me in equal parts, um, but not always like, you know, so you go through periods. Sometimes there's more of the, 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 the silly stuff or you know and then there's other shows that are m more slanted towards maybe more uh, serious or real material um it, it's problematic it's become increasingly problematic um although maybe it shouldn't be maybe you could talk me out of it but uh in because in the beginning when people listened to the show they assumed everything they were hearing was true because it's on cbc radio and it's uh Radio is, you know, it's it's kind of like a, a medium for, it's a newsy medium. Right. And people take things that they hear on the radio at face value. They're used to listening to Michael Enright. Right. And um, which is wonderful because, uh, it, it, you know, for, for initially for my purposes, because I was able to access that part of people's brains where they, um, you know, that they listen to, um, they, they, you know, I mean, there's a particular thing that happens when, like, even when you go to see a movie and before it starts, it says this is based on true events or whatever, you know, it kind of, um, it, it, it opens like a different pathway in the brain or something. And um, so uh, that was fun in the beginning. Um, and people assume when people were listening and assuming that what they were hearing was true. Not that, I mean, I set out to kind of fool people, but um, I, I guess uh, I kind of wanted to erase that line I didn't want to think about it. I, I just was I think I was after a particular kind of um, mood you know a certain kind of uh, um, radio ambience or something that I would try to cultivate through music and tone and right. things like that that was what was more important to me as the show continued the opposite thing began to happen where people assumed that everything that they were hearing wasn't true right which became uh, more frustrating because um 
then it was sort of like, what was the point of having a real person come on the show who's doing something actually quite amazing and remarkable if people are going to assume that it's bull, you know, that it's bullshit. Yeah. Um, so I continued to try to tip my hand enough to, you know, to give kind of like cues as to what whether they're listening to something that's real or fake and because sometimes uh, you have to almost it seems you have to implore people that no for real this is uh this isn't a a fake conversation like what when you were asking people to call in for the advice show or right that was real like that was actual people who had called in um and i think you could kind of tell it it was it, it it could be frustrating and and i have only myself to blame because it's sort of like i painted myself into a corner you know um but like for instance i did one episode where i confronted this guy who was imposturing me on twitter i don't know if you heard that one yeah and um everyone that i spoke to afterwards people that work in radio people that i work with you know who um, understand how radio works and stuff like that they were like that wasn't a real story was it yeah i remember myself going back and forth right but between... i mean the, but the but like what would be the point i mean if it was fake then i would have like up the ante maybe i would have made it more absurd more crazy where this person was like penetrating into other aspects of my life and stuff like that um so but I, even but even the fiction is is you know plausibly real right it seems uh, to be take underlying characters and just exaggerate it a bit. It's not totally out of this world fiction where you know it is. That's right. Yeah, it's um, it 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 is it is kind of like it. Um, yeah, it takes place in our in our universe usually. I mean, sometimes it gets a little bit more cartoony, which I like too. I mean, I'm curious about how the show is heard. It's difficult for me to say because I'm on right. the inside of it. But yeah, I mean, I feel like the bottom line is to try to um, make it entertaining, and um, and to cast the net sort of broad enough because it's broadcasting and um and yeah so i think like i'll say this like initially i did not start off with this philosophy like i'm going to create a show where it blurs the line like it was it was it came out of uh, necessity um because i came out of um i was a producer for for a few years for for some years at uh, this american life and uh it was hard to find stories and we had a there was a you know a sizable production staff and um a wider network of uh there was you know other contributing editors at the time and uh basically a lot of people dedicated to story finding and even so it was very difficult to find the 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 good stories and often stories that started off good that even went into production were cut because they weren't good enough so i wasn't in a case i wasn't in a situation where i had that kind of um that kind of time or money Right, and so if I had half a story that sounded like this was, good, it started off like I wanted to find real stories. So, here's an example: like on the first episode, um, a friend of mine uh, was installing his VCR, and he was flipping stations at, to to program stations into his VCR, and he got way up the band to like set channel seventy two or whatever. And um, all of a sudden, he found the station that he never knew existed, which was the closed caption, uh, or what do you call it, like security cam footage um, of a building's lobby. Um, But the thing that piqued his interest was that he did not live in a building with a lobby, so he didn't know where this image was coming from. And over the next few weeks, he became increasingly curious about it. He would, from time to time, like flip to that station. Um, if it was a choice on a Sunday between watching golf or watching what he started to call the lobby channel, he would watch the lobby channel. Or when he was out walking his dog, he would kind of like peer into buildings and see what their lobbies looked like. And he would look for clues. Like he would watch it and see what the outside of the street looked like, what people came in and out. And that was about it. That was like so it it felt like it was the setup to kind of something that could potentially like the stage was set for something that could happen that was dramatic it felt like the opening act of something right but nothing happened so we ended up continuing to talk and improvising various scenarios and this was a friend who um did not have any training as an actor but uh we simulated like in the same tone we kind of branched off into like i said why don't you try what would happen if a woman appeared and uh, let's say we up the ante in terms of your obsession like you started watching it all the time you started throwing in uh, uh, VHS tapes when you left the house so you wouldn't miss anything and you could fast forward Um, 
because uh, growing out of his obsession with this woman that he starts to fall in love with, who who's who he starts to note when she uh, comes into the building and when she leaves the building, and how she fumbles with her keys and how she often drops her keys and all of these things that are kind of making her increasingly lovable to him. And um, we tried all kinds of different scenarios where he finally meets the woman, and all of those weren't as satisfying as the one that we ended up using in the end was um, what happens is he's watching her. She comes home from work one evening with a guy, and it's the first time he's ever seen her with a guy. And um, he watches waiting for the guy to come down, and he watches all night. He takes his meals in front of the TV, and it's like past midnight, and he finally realizes the guy's not coming down. And um, and what was so great about it was, like, I think I had a way that I saw it going. Like, I wanted to see him kind of freak out a little bit more, but it wasn't in his nature. And he was kind of like, he showed a lot of integrity because he was like, I was like, didn't that drive you crazy? And he was like, no. And I was like, really? Like, because you were, it sounded as though you were starting to really feel, have feelings for this woman, you know? Um, and he was like, no, um, you know, I didn't really know her. And, you know, spring was coming. And um, I felt good for her, you know, and I felt happy for her. Yeah. And it kind of ended on that kind of a note. And he, but he sold it like in his performance. And um, it was just really fun to direct a non-actor, who, someone who just had natural ability, who was able to um, sound real. Right. And uh, it was uh, cool. People really responded to it. Um, this American Life ended up running it which was odd because they don't usually run stuff like that. And I remember at the the, the host, Ira, uh, ba- oh, only at the end of the piece announced that it was actually, it veered off into fiction so as not to kind of step on the uh, your enjoyment of it, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that was like the first kind of, like I think that was kind of like a, in, in some ways a blueprint for what the show was during those opening seasons, right. you know? Part of the reason I like the show or maybe connect with it is that it seems to be, a meditation on on what what is real and and the absurd too the absurdity of of our everyday existence and how we have all these grand visions of who we are and, and our place in the world but really w- when you tear it down it's really quite trivial and and just devoid of, of purpose that the, um, that the comedy is uh that that's sort of played for laughs in a way yeah like it, it's but it almost comes from a dark place it does yeah i um, think it does yeah um were, were you from an early age preoccupied with questions of, of meaning and, and what what is real? Yeah, I think so. I think I really, I think I was. I think I was, um, yeah, like when I trace back to my earliest memories, I think I was pretty much, like I, I was actually just talking to a friend about this, about this memory of, um, of I couldn't, I, we, I lived in New York. I was born in New York and I lived there until I was about, my, my family lived there until I was about four. So I know that I couldn't have been older than four because it took place in our old apartment in Brooklyn. And I remember having this realization of how much I was going to have to blink in my lifetime. And I started to get like really stressed and anxious about it. At, you know, I, I wasn't older than four and I was like completely freaked out about it. And I remember like locking myself in the closet in the dark so that I didn't like have to think about blinking and didn't know whether my eyes were closed or not. Um, And I think that's like, that's kind of what's weird, I guess, for a kid to be already that kind of neurotic. Um, But uh, I also remember asking my dad where God came from and thinking like, this was an obvious one that adults must already know about. And I remember like he told me to look it up in my, I had this children's encyclopedia set. And so I looked up God and I read the entry, and there was no mention of it. And then to me, it just seemed like such a fundamental... You know what I mean? Like, you don't know. You're a kid. You don't understand that this is something that people have been pondering yeah. since the beginning of time, maybe. And um, so I think, like, those... I don't know. Like, I think they're fundamental to being human, regardless of whether you're a kid, or it was to me, anyway. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, like... Um, I think, like, I do toggle between like the you know the how how these questions are kind of they they're they're fodder for 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 absurdity um and how also but there's also like a a kind of um there's an aspect of uh, of it that's uh 
that can kind of make you anxious, you know, and fill you with a certain kind of um, fear, you know. So what were you like uh, throughout your childhood? Were you sort of a solitary guy or or were you really social like were you constantly pondering the, these questions throughout i think i was probably like a serious kid i mean i still like i i was just recently i was like in a bar and someone came up to me and said why do you look so sad and i was like oh i just always look like this i i mean i i think i was that kind of kid uh i think i and it was difficult uh, i think to like kind of um the kind of cultivate like i didn't have like a uh a free and easy sort of um, bearing, uh, continence, countenance, in, in count, incontinence. I'm not sure. Um, I, like, I uh, I don't know. I was like a serious kid. I was kind of, I guess I was sort of intense. I remember staying at my grandparents, and I remember um, my grandfather forcing me to go outside and play with kids on the street. And the, the idea of it just seemed like insane. I mean why um, because you were wondering what the point of, of it all is no, it just seemed like impenetrable like how do you even i don't like i just i didn't think i didn't i don't know that i had that kind of um ease in the world or that kind of like it just seemed i don't know i mean uh, it, it scared me you know and uh, and it didn't interest me and i remember i went he he lived in a duplex and i went downstairs and i stood in the basement isn't that crazy like i just leaned against the wall i remember just like and giving it enough time to f for him to think that I had been outside playing. And this seemed like a better sort of um, alternative, you know what I mean? He would feel better. I, this was better for me, probably better for the kids because I didn't feel like they would necessarily enjoy me. And then after a while, I went upstairs and, he, and I told him I really had a great time. <laughs> and he probably knew I was lying. And who knows, you have no sense of time when you're a kid, so I might have only been like leaning against the wall for like two minutes, yeah. you know. How old were you? Um... Probably pretty young. I mean, while I was in Montreal, so I don't know, like maybe seven or so. And, and do you remember why you you didn't want to go do the normal things that that kids would do? Um, I don't know. I mean, I could probably. I still. I don't know that I can answer it now. Like, I mean, you know, I work at the CBC, and um, it's a pretty sociable group of people, and um, and nice people, like people that I like, and every day everybody eats together at in the uh, uh, like they have their lunch together and it's a thing that they do and I, i've just never done it i usually eat lunch at my desk like watching stuff on youtube or uh you know kind of working or talking on the phone or, you know what i mean and um yeah so i don't think i was that different in a lot of ways as a kid was i in so but your sort of enjoyment of being in your own headspace instead of having to be in... i think enjoyment is a strong word but okay <laughs> well I'll, I'll accept that okay um well what would you call it um i would say like a kind of um reticence no like a, a, a kind of uh, an okayness i guess you know i mean it's not always easy for other people to be in their own head to be in my head i mean i you know and and i think that's a part of like and that's probably typical of other people who broadcast or write or do whatever where you you're trying to normalize your yourself in the world i think that's a part of it like you're taking all your basic weirdnesses all the things that you you've been told like you are kind of like a weirdo you know and trying to kind of um dig out a little niche for yourself in the world where people you could kind of justify yourself or right. allow yourself to be made to translate yourself into something that's relatable right an aspect of yourself that's relatable to others and that's kind of maybe a way of socializing yourself and it's like takes a lot more machinations or whatever for other people it's just natural you know what i mean i sometimes feel like my life would have been a lot easier if i had an easier smile maybe or if i had an easier laugh you know as in socially and also as an interviewer i mean if i you know we're talking about like how a lot of the conversations that i have on the radio show are over the telephone and if there was some a way to signify like I'm enjoying you you're doing well you know I find you funny you know if I had that kind of an easy laugh it would make my job easier and it would make my life possibly easier to allow because like oftentimes and I've heard this from like people that I end up becoming close with that initially they thought I didn't like them you know and um 
it's definitely like not something that I would I want to cultivate. You know, I would want people to know that I like them, and I think I've become more verbal about that. Like I've had to, you know, um, do it in my own way. You know, like I mean, I remember also like when I was you know young and dating, uh, my hands would sweat a lot. And I felt like it would be so much easier if I could just reach over and hold a girl's hand or, you know, to indicate that I like her. But I couldn't because my hands were always, like, dripping in sweat. So I had to create all of these other ways. You know what I mean? And maybe something as stupid as that. Like, maybe that's what made me more verbal. Right. You know? Maybe I, you know, who knows? Maybe maybe if I had, like, a really nice head of hair and I was able to just kind of, like, flip it back out of my face in a provocative way maybe that would have also cut down in the verbosity you know yeah whip your hair back and forth and then she would know Th- that's right i mean and and so i don't know i guess you become the person that you become because of all the the accumulation of all these of all these things that you're saddled with that uh that hopefully i mean the positive way of looking at it is that they could become uh you know they can they can make you the person you are in uh not in a fatalistic sense, but like in a in a positive way, you know. In in your writings and 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 pieces on your radio show, it, it seems that there's there's often the theme of the vulnerable outsider, right? Yeah. So one story you do is um, Lois Lane takes a break from Superman and, right. and dates this this ordinary guy. This regular schlep, yeah. yeah. Who's constantly being compared to Superman in her mind and in his own mind, yeah. Yeah, as, you know, it would be inevitable to, to happen. Yeah. Um, and who wants to be compared to Superman? You're going you're gonna to lose. You're yeah. going to lose. But it's sort of like it justifies the loss, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of, the character, I think, has a certain kind of ease with it because it's like, what like he's gonna beat me like he can outbox me outthink me he can reverse fucking time you know and go back in time and punch hitler in the face like he's not he can't win and um i think there's a kind of clarity like he's able to make his peace with that in some ways in a way that uh most people don't get to make you know what i mean if you're comparing yourself to your ex's great boyfriend you know right he's still within the the universe right you know realm of existence so somehow yeah we're more jealous of that or yeah so it was in a way it's kind of liberating um but uh yeah it's also um yeah and and you also do uh do the story about what it's like for joseph to have a husband of of mary to have the ex-boyfriend is god yeah yeah cheated with your wife is cheating with god in a sense yeah and he's kind of torn between feeling like it's sort of flattering that his girlfriend is good enough for god and at the same time feeling like you know a cuckold um yeah i think i like that kind of thing of like combining um uh the the you know these kind of like mundane neuroses with uh like uh, against these kind of like epic or fantastical backdrops, you know. Yeah. I also like working because, like, for the, these are radio things too. Like, where um, for the purposes to be economical, um, to start off a story with characters that you already know and you have expectations about, so you got that out of way and you can move on with the jokes and the other things, you know, and subvert those expectations and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um. Was that is that sort of your experience, or at least when you were growing up, did you feel like an outsider? Um, yeah, I mean, but doesn't everybody, or maybe they don't so much? Um, because it must have been hard to relate when you're contemplating all these ginormous questions, that all all the most essential questions of life, that surely not many children are are, are thinking about. Or contemplating it does God exist or, or who made God and, and there was I mean there was like a ton of things that like just I remember when I was 16 I remember uh, I went through a period where I became kind of religious actually I, I was going to synagogue every morning and I remember I became obsessed with this idea of um, like just the perpetuity of um, consciousness you know like I because I I, I I felt like okay well you know if I if I do believe and I have faith and, uh, you know, then there's a life after death and, uh, you continue to exist in some form, 
that idea actually started to fill me with terror. Like I caught, I felt like I, when I meditated on it, I caught glimpses of just what that would, never being able to escape yourself somehow. I mean, it was all ridiculous, you know? I mean, because I, there was no way to really contemplate that stuff. And, um, but that filled me with an incredible kind of dread and depression. Everlasting consciousness. Yeah. When I was 16. Really? Yeah. No, it, it was kind of like, I don't know. I think like when I got older and I read certain authors, I and just to kind of feel like, you know, to read Beckett or whatever, and who kind of deals with some of those things in some ways, and to feel like other people were thinking about these things, I think that was a comfort. I think it's almost, in a way, more difficult when you're a kid and you um, discover these things and you don't know what they are and sort of like you're inventing the world on your own you're the first man in a way you know right. what i mean like when you discover you feel alone with these questions yeah and i mean it's kind of you know it's like when you're a kid and you discover um you know masturbation or whatever and you're like what the hell's this you know right. and you think like you're the first person who's ever and you're like it's magical and it's also kind of uh mysterious you know and then you get older and um you, you start to figure these things out. You realize that other people have been there before. And there's something uh, comforting about that. I mean, comforting about the society of others and being able to, like, you know, um, in your basic aloneness, to have other people, to connect with other people, becomes a, uh, a comfort. Um, and hopefully it makes you, you, you know, you don't, you don't end up feeling less, less special because of it have you read jean vanier becoming human by any chance no i don't i don't know who that is okay he he, he did this massey lecture and, and mm -hmm. basically he just talks about how it's through our own acceptance of our vulnerability mm -hmm. and through sort of peeling away those facades of uh, that we presented the world and and we hide behind of, of being having figured stuff out um that's only through doing that that we actually fully become human, right? And that we can accept both ourselves and others. Right. Um, is, is that your own experience? Because in your show or throughout your work, it's always, it's very self-deprecating, yeah, right? And it's very accepting of both your own vulnerability and of, of others. You know, you have people like the guy who starts eating rabbit pellets and, and, yeah. and, and people who sort of pour their hearts out on, yeah. on the show. Um, so do you see an importance in, in being vulnerable and being okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think like, um, I think there should be a space on the radio or, you know, wherever else where like, look, the show was on uh, Sundays for years right after the Vinyl Cafe, which is a very upbeat kind of folksy, you know, we're all feeling good and things are good and we're having fun and that's great. And I like the show. Um, but I think when you're not feeling so great, I think a, a, a show like that or things like that or just the, the, the beautiful weather outside your window could be painful in a particular kind of way when you feel outside of that. Mm -hmm. So I think they like to create a space where people feel kind of crappy or, you know what I mean, like is kind of a comfort, I think. I think it's important to have that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, you know, there's nothing that makes you sadder than when someone's like, come on, put on a, sm a happy face or whatever, you know, you need... Even if it's a kind of wallowing space, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think of like, back to this normalizing thing, like, you know, I, 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 I was saying before, I think we started recording that I, I just came back. I, I don't do a lot of traveling, but I recently did some traveling and I went to uh, Australia and I was, you know, I took these long flights. And when I'm actually honest with myself and I think, um, it's, it's, I, I mean, I wonder, like, do other people think this way or am I really crazy? Like, that's the kind of question, like, cause you want to keep it relatable, particularly with a broadcast medium where you want to, you're, 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 um, you're casting the net wide, you want to be inclusive. And so you, you kind of want to, um, you're, it's a tightrope walk with the weirdness, you know what I mean? You want to allow some weirdness in because that's what, that's what really spices up the broth, you know, but you don't want to make it so weird that it becomes unrelatable. But I often like, and it's, it's, you know, I'll put things out there to see just how relatable they are. And it's a little bit like a, a kind of, um, uh, a certain kind of uh, striptease or something. I don't know. That's maybe not the right analogy, but like getting back to this flight thing, like I, you know, like I'm on the flight and I'm sitting beside a couple people. I'm in the middle row and I'm sitting there for hours. And I, and I feel like a lot of that time is given up to 
trying to prove my own normality to these complete strangers. You know what I mean? Like right down to, um, you know, do I want to order another scotch? Will that seem kind of like deviant social behavior? Um, I should take, and maybe I'm watching too much of these movies on the back of the chair in front of me. I should pick up a book. I think these people should know that I'm a balanced human being that doesn't watch like 10 hours of TV. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe I should have a sip of water. Hydrating is normal, you know? Like, really, like, that's that's kind of obs that's obsessive thinking. Um, and maybe I'm playing out some version of people's thought process in a more intense kind of way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but you don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, how, how far is going too far? How much do you really reveal of, like, just how completely batty you are? You know what I mean? And at what point does do people turn off the radio, you know? Um, kind of um, spoon feeding the crazy to the public at large. Yeah, and, and it, it also seems to be because that connects in with there's all these arbitrary things in life, right? Like you know that most people can take for granted. You just don't think about how many times you take a sip of water on the plane to feel normal, right? Or you just everyone just goes plays outside. That's what people do. Yeah. Right. Whereas it seems to be a continuing theme, both both with what you're saying and, and with the show is that not being able to take these things for granted, right? These social conventions are just like the the things that are invisible. For granted. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, and in some ways that is, it, it, it could make for interesting writing when you kind of like are kind of outside looking at it with an alien eye. It kind of makes it new. That's what poetry does. I mean, not that I'm doing that or anything, but like you take things that all of a sudden people like have been looking at for years and you make it new. To them, you know, like I mean, but it, but there's definitely like there's a definite uh, obsessive aspect to it. Like I mean, you know, on some days, like I'll be walking down the street and like, you know, halfway down the block, I'll see a puddle, and I'll start timing my footsteps, thinking like, at what point am I going to hit that puddle so I don't have to break my stride? So measuring my footsteps and the length of my footsteps and my and my strides, you know, that, but that's kind of crazy. Mm. At least I know it is. Uh, there's um the one example you you give in the show about um how you think there's two people in life how you'll watch a sad movie and immediately after when you start crying you'll yeah. run to the mirror to see how how you right. look yeah um yeah and i think that writers are prone to that kind of thing that kind of narrative keeping an aspect of that objectivity or yeah. or performers you know so it, it seems like yeah having one one foot in in the world and another out of it questioning is this really am i really sad right now or am i just yeah and i think i mean i think that's a human thing i mean that's a part of being conscious of your consciousness you know uh self-conscious uh but um yeah i think it could also be a kind of prote protective device you know to I mean? kind of keep you even you know what i mean to not i mean it could be not so great when you're not able to actually fully throw yourself into the moment but it can also kind of when the moment's not so great it kind of allows you a certain kind of stepping outside the moment you know mm -hmm. there's a great passage in um i don't know if you ever read this writer john fonte um where he's drowning and there's a part of him that's already like narrating it you know because like the writing gene or whatever it is is so like deeply ingrained even though like he's he really thinks he's gonna die but there is still this voice that's kind of like describing what's going on and stuff like that and how he would kind of write it you know what i mean and that's like you kind of know who you are if that you know you know how deep these things run if you're kind of confronted with death and you still are being that that way you know mm -hmm. so do you find you sometimes you know are chagrined because you can't go along with just the flow or the present nature of what's going on yeah but and i think as a kid i think like that was lonely um because i felt like I, I wasn't, I was doing something wrong, you know. Uh, I have a memory also actually of like, I couldn't have been more than like eight or something uh, where uh, an uncle of mine had brought me to the zoo. And he was kind of like a flashy guy. He was like this sort of guy who carried around a big wad of bills and he bought me and my sister cotton candy. It was the only, it was the first time I had, probably maybe the only time I had had cotton candy. And it just seemed so ostentatious and like, uh, it's a weird food. And um, I remember he was like really putting a lot of energy into giving us a good time. And I felt like I had to give something back to him. And I felt like this pressure, even at such a young age. And I remember at one point he stood me up on the fence looking at maybe goats or something. And I remember 
I felt like the thing to say right now is that, like I have to make some kind of pronouncement. And I remember it saying, this is the happiest day of my life. And I remember, I remember saying it and actually it getting stuck in my throat and feeling like I didn't sell the line and feeling like I don't really mean this or did like this is kind of awkward. I, you know what I mean? And that's weird. You no, know, I guess for a kid to kind of have that kind of self-consciousness. And I remember actually feeling that way. And, um, so that's, that's kind of makes you, that's lonely. But then I guess like as an adult, I, you know, was fortunate enough to be able to parlay it into a way to make money, you know, a cottage industry of sorts, you know, or just, you know, using that to, um, you know, to, uh, to be a writer, I guess. Did, did you always want to be a writer? Like, I think so, yeah. Yeah, growing I, up you, you were... I do, yeah. Problem? I do think so, yeah. I think like as early as I remember, in, even as early as grade five, keeping notebooks and uh, writing plays uh, and in elementary writing school. poems. Yeah, yeah, always keeping notebooks. And where do you think that, that came from, just as a, a natural outcome of, of being so inwardly looking? I don't know. I think I was raised in a house full of books. My dad was a reader, and uh, it seemed like I was, I guess I was instilled in me in a, at a young age was the, uh, the, 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 the importance of books and reading and uh, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, it seemed like an aspiration. Um, and I liked books, I think. Uh, so I think I started reading as almost as young as I started writing. It just seemed part and parcel, you know. And I liked making comic books also. I wasn't very, I, I'm still, I feel like I'm a frustrated, I love comics and I love uh, comic books and stuff. And I feel like a bit of a, a frustrated comic artist. Um, so yeah, I think like it's weird too, like to think that um, now I'm making these little radio plays. And I was what I did when I was like a little kid. I used to make radio plays for my sister to entertain her, you know, and I used to get my friends to do that with me also. Um, so it's weird. It's sort of like things haven't really changed, you know. So you went to university at, at McGill? I d only for um, a few courses. Uh, I got my degree at Concordia. Okay. So yeah. what was your undergrad in? English, literature. Was it like a conscious thing that you were telling people that that's what you wanted to do was be a writer? Well, I wanted to, to do creative writing, and I could not get in. Um I applied a few times, and it was very frustrating. And um, I mean, I couldn't get any traction. I mean, I have boxes of just rejection. Like, I, I think I hadn't, you know, when I talk about the weird, I think like I was tipping more towards the weird. Uh, the portfolios that I submitted were really bizarre, like really crazy. And I think it was sort of like a part of that. I think stand-up comedians talk about this, that kind of like wanting to push further and further on stage where you kind of want to make an audience, you want to really reveal yourself to an audience to the point where they should hate you. And maybe they will hate you, but you're going to bring them back. And you're there's something really deeply psychological that's going on. You mm -hmm. know, um, you're playing out some kind of um, psychodrama. And I think it was a bit like that. Like I was putting out a lot of very ugly kind of thoughts um, and weird stuff in these portfolios. Like I could understand, I remember like it, it was all that I wanted was to get into this creative writing program. And I was in my early twenties and uh, I remember I met with the head of the program. I made an appointment with him to find out why I didn't get in. And he said to me, someone who writes the way that you write needs to be in therapy, not in a creative writing program. And I remember being devastated because um, I felt like I didn't know what else I could do if I couldn't write and I couldn't get into this creative writing program. And I knew that even then, that I, like, even if I wasn't going to get published, I was going to continue to write. I mean, I just was. I would, uh, and for many years I worked crappy jobs and I continued to write my weird stuff and I would continue to do it. And did you publish them anywhere? When you were no, early? no, I couldn't even get into zines. Like I couldn't, I was like, when I say that I was getting rejection letters, it wasn't to the New Yorker. It was to like really, you know, weird, like, you know, you know, crazy kooky zines with circulations of like four. Um, I was just really hungry for any kind of, I mean, I remember the first place that I got anything into was Broken Pencil and it was just thrilling. It was just really exciting. 
Um, but yeah, the portfolios, man, like there was like just really weird stuff. I'm Can trying to like think, yeah, I'm trying to think of like real, like just, um, weird kind of edible relate, like plays that were like about mothers, um, abusing their, like, I, I I'm just trying to think. Because I know I'm like being really vague, but it was just like really uh, a lot of like gratuitous, like almost pornographic, and um, or pornographic and uh, and just really bizarre and maybe like even like just bizarre for the sake of being bizarre. But I also feel like maybe I guess I was waiting for someone to to um, to see something in it. You know what I mean? To see that maybe there was something, there was a diamond in the rough there, you know? Um, but it took a really long time, you know, for that, for that to happen. And, and so, okay, you go to, uh, to Concordia for English literature and you were writing things and, and then you go to, uh, another pro- a master's program. I, I did remember. a master's program. Yeah. It, actually, finally I got into creative writing. Yeah. The master's version, I guess. Yes. I finally, I finally did that and it was really, uh, very exciting and I remember I had applied I didn't think I was going to get in and so I applied to also into teaching teachers college I was going to I was going to go to um, teach kids oh like you know become an elementary school teacher that's what I was going to do my father's uh, was a high school teacher and I thought you know you can make a decent living and that's what I'll do and then I got accepted into the master's program and I think I was kind of like on the fence about which one I wanted to do and um I chose to do the master's program. It just seemed more exciting to me. And um, and I think my life would have been different had I, maybe I would have been quite unhappy as a, as a teacher, even though like I did feel like it was a noble profession, you know? So you were, you were very close to giving it up then? Giving it up, I don't think I would have ever stopped give, writing. Giving it up as, as sort of what you do in life. Yes, I think I was, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, and even then with the master's program, I think like, I, I think the ceiling was very low in terms of my expectation. Like, I don't know. I guess I guess a, a, it's sort of an adolescent thing where you kind of like you toggle back and forth between thinking you're the greatest in the world, you're the greatest writer who's ever lived, and having this very aristocratic kind of, um, you know, bearing in your own mind anyway, and then also thinking like you're nothing. You're not going to. Um, you're not. You're never going to be able to make a living doing this. You know. Uh, so I think part of, I'm trying to remember what I was, my thoughts were, I think like I wanted to take a stab at it. I wanted to create a context for myself to actually write a book. And, uh, that seemed like a safer bet to be able to do it while doing an MA and to be able to get, uh, some loans and some bursaries. But I don't know. I think like maybe I was afraid to dream too big. I think like maybe ultimately I felt like, well, you know, I can continue on doing this graduate school and maybe be able to teach, you know, that would, that would be pretty damn all right also because at the time like i I think i'd been like telemarketing so jordy started telemarketing when you were in the master's program in the creative writing i think i kind of stopped at a certain point because i started to get some more freelance work and i was able to stop but prior to going into the ma program yeah like i'd been telemarketing for years you know okay so there's a big gap between your undergrad and yeah there was there was a gap actually yeah I, i went back to school i went back to school yeah years later so, so you left under, undergrad then and, and said you were going to try to make it as a writer and then ended up having to take the telemarketing job? As... Yeah, no, I knew I was going to have to have a job. Um, but uh, to me, it was kind of a great life. Like I, um, I had uh, a very cheap apartment and uh, I was kind of at flexible hours with the telemarketing and I had the freedom to come home and write and... Uh, I liked it, you know, I thought that was, that was, it was pretty good. It allowed me uh, the years to learn actually how to write, you know. What was it like, um, you, you just wrote some, some articles in the National Post about your time. Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. What was it like, I'm curious, because, you know, when you're a young person in your 20s and everyone's doing exciting things, um, you go to parties and, and people ask you what you do, right? Yeah. And, and you talk about this in the article. Um, what was that like at the time? Because here you are and you still, 
you see yourself as a writer and that's what... I was never able to say I was a writer though I think like only maybe recently I don't even know now that I do it I'll say I'm a radio producer or something um, yeah it's a hard because it's like one of those like words that are kind of like an active verb sort of like you're a writer meaning you're writing and I don't know it was, maybe it's almost a jinxy thing like even now I kind of feel like I can't guarantee that I'm going to be able to write the coming week's show I don't know that I'll have anything to write about or you know mm-hmm. um but uh and it seems so definitive too that i am a writer i, I am a writer write. i yeah it seems pretty grand um but i don't know it seemed like when i was younger in the 90s in montreal like no one was really doing very much of anything i, I don't know that i knew people who i don't know i didn't know anybody who was like doing an internship you know or i don't know maybe it was like a, a time of slackers right and so you were surrounded by by friends who are doing Harper's internships or things no, like that. I didn't even know. Like when I started working at This American Life when I was older already uh, and I met my fe- the fellow producers there and they like, yeah, like they were doing just that. Like one of them had been doing an internship at MTV and someone who was a couple people had done internships at Harper's and I was like, didn't even know about this kind of thing. You know, it was just so completely off my radar. Like the ceiling was just so low, I guess, to dream. Like I didn't even know to have these dreams. And, um, and uh yeah i guess i just never felt yeah like it's funny actually i was as i was coming up the campus to come here to talk to you i was remembering i when i first dropped out of school i guess um i was 19 and i came to live in toronto and i got a job in an insurance office clerking and uh i remember coming home from work the way I remember it was like my, you know, my one sports jacket slung over my shoulder and walking by the U of T campus and seeing kids who were really my own age, uh, kind of like hanging out on the campus and uh, sunbathing and like playing Frisbee. And I, I swear I had the thought of like, you know, all oh, these kids are really like, it's, it's, must, it's nice to be young, blah, blah, blah. Like what the hell my problem was, you know what I mean? I had just totally counted myself out. I had somehow kind of... Um, erased my own youth my own possibility i don't know why you know like i just i don't know i was uh i guess it was just the kind of kid that i was like i I feel like now i feel a lot younger than i did then and i feel a lot kind of uh freer in the world yeah you know because if you're even 10 and you're you're feeling for was was it your uncle who who was was taking me to to the zoo uh, yeah that's right um I feel like, and you feel responsible for their sort of yeah. emotional happiness. Yeah, I know. Then I know. You, were you ever really a child, really? Uh, yeah, because like, what's, or what's, a, young what's person. a kid then, right? Yeah, because that is immaturity, is it only thinking about yourself in a sense, right? Uh, or my working I definition so. for an adult or someone who's mature would be... Someone who's, yeah, the, that's, that's a good way of putting it. In the drive here uh, to Toronto from Montreal, I was with, uh, I was driving with my friend Tucker and he was playing all these old punk songs and stuff and uh, there was a Clash song that came on and I was remembering how one of the only times I actually felt young was uh, it was a summer I spent uh, in uh, Wildwood, New Jersey and in fact actually they're going I do a story about it on This American Life that they're going to be rebroadcasting this week and um, it was running home in the rain with this guy this older kid that was really cool he was like 19 and he dressed all in black this was the 80s you know and it was like on jersey shore and he'd dress all in black and he had like this long coke pinky fingernail that was pierced with rings he was really into bauhaus and um he had this um this boom box and london calling on it and i remember it was the first time i ever heard it and it started to rain and we were running back to the boarding house that we both lived in and we listened to at least the first six songs off of the first side of London Calling and running it in the rain. And uh, it was great. That was, was like a freeing experience. I was like, I, like, that's like, that was like one of the only, I was like, I felt that, that felt kind of like, like that's what it, that's what being young should feel like. Yeah. You know, and I recognized it at the time, but those moments were so few and far between. And escaping your meanness in a sense. Uh, yeah, I guess just allowing myself to just be, you know to just dance around like in the rain and (laughs) and listen to music you know and be unselfconscious for a while yeah yeah i heard this um a piece you you did on cbc's 
tapestry uh-huh. where you talk about looking into the mirror right. for a long time yeah. <laughs> and sort of trying to to deal with the uh, the idea of who my your own existence or, yeah. or what it means until you, it's sort of finally switched off after a while to kind of escape your own meanness to yeah. kind of look at yourself from without yeah yeah so are you able to get those moments now or, or is doing the show or writing is that is that a way that you accomplish that yeah maybe maybe so actually because i mean i'm you know i don't know if you have this feeling how much radio you've done but like you kind of escape it in a way when you start producing your own stuff like you you know at first when you hear your voice your recorded voice you think it's so weird and doesn't sound like you but when you get used to it and you start getting used to editing your own voice tracks and your own interviews and stuff like that you escape your own meanness I think in a way um and I find like those moments are rare like I talk about staring at yourself in the mirror it's a kind of like it's an act of meditation it takes a while to kind of step out your out of yourself and even then it's only you're stepping out of your physical self in a way but those moments when you come face to face with who you are are rare I mean because you're telling the story constantly of who you are um and you're justifying yourself and your your own choices but to actually like feel who you are in real life experiences i think that's uh those those moments can be kind of profound Mm -hmm. i think you know when you actually feel who you who you are you know right and it's sort of undefinable it is i mean it's yeah it's it's not like yeah it's definitely it's it's not always easily to put into words like i had an experience like that um while traveling uh just a couple of weeks ago, I, I was in Bali and um, I won't go into the details, but I had this moment of like fear, you know, and I, rather than seeing it as like something external to me, I actually had this moment of clarity where I felt like this is, this is me. I am this, I am my fear. And it sounds kind of corny, but to feel it in the moment was sort of like, um, was re- re- revelatory in a way. It was sort of like, um, I can't explain it, but it was like, it was, it was profound. You know, I felt like this is who I am. I mean, I, I'm constantly kind of unraveling knots all the time in my own brain and justifying my own fear or turning it into other things. But I mean, viscerally, I just felt like this kind of in my body, I felt this kind of fear and I, I was able to kind of freeze time for a moment and almost kind of feel tenderly towards myself, you know what I mean? Or kind of talk myself down in this way that, uh, it was kind of like, um, it was a good moment, I think, to have. Um, I haven't entirely figured it out and made sense of it, but it, it, it was a, it was a good moment. It was sort of like a feeling of kind of like, you know. Again, I mean, it sounds so like kind of corny, but like if you're able to kind of regard yourself with a little bit of compassion, you're gonna probably have greater success in being compassionate to other people too. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, so, can I ask what what actually happened? Oh, it was. Um, I, I mean, I have to like. It was just, it was, it was a moment where I was outside this, uh, I mean, the setting was just so totally like ripe for this kind of like moment of illumination or something. And I think if I was that kind of guy, I would maybe phrase it in that way, but I'm not so much, not that I have anything against that kind of wording or whatever, but it was, um, I was in, I was actually even wearing a sarong, uh, that you had to wear before entering into the courtyard of this temple. And, um, Anyway, at one point I wandered outside the gates. I was kind of curious because that's the kind of guy I am. Like, what's going on in the alleys? You know, who are the people that live near this temple? You know, what's their life like? And um, so I wandered out into the alley and I saw this lotus flower fall from the sky. Or just I saw it like kind of caught in my peripheral vision in the moment when it landed on the ground. And I was like, oh, that. And I looked up and I saw there was nothing there. And I was like, that's kind of weird. And um, I went over to pick it up because I felt like I should have some moment with it, you know, uh, smell it maybe. And as I bent down to pick it up, um, on the other side, like but be- between me and the lotus flower, there was this kind of, a, I guess you would call it a gutter where the water, sewer water drains or whatever. And I saw something scurry through it. And uh, I, th- I thought it was a rat or something. It turned out it was a cat. It was just uh, a tabby. It looked a lot like a tabby that I had as a kid which also kind of added to the, um, you know, it was just sort of like an intersection of a whole bunch of different things happening. And it was, there was a certain kind of economy to the moment, uh, kind of haiku like sort of like Lotus flower, cat, fear, reaching aspiration for beauty. You know what I mean? Wanting a transcendent moment, being caught by my own fear 
and it was like just a it would all happened like within three seconds but it just kind of like there was just this perfect kind of intersection of all of these little things happening all at once where i kind of recognized myself in that moment and in what i was feeling the fear the um the reaching the aspiration the wanting to seize beauty something of beauty um it just kind of stopped me and it and it just kind of um every and I just kind of walked around Bali for the next couple of days just getting all weepy and not really knowing what to do. like you know it's like one of those things where like weepy because because of the transcendent feeling yeah I guess so yeah just kind of like holy sh- like I don't know it wasn't a huge thing but it was sort of like I recognized myself in that feeling and for 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 a moment you glimpsed it I guess yeah or did it stay with you or was it just no it was in that moment and I didn't know what to do with it um I still don't know what to do with it um but I did feel like I was given something, like something irrefutable. I was given a look at myself in a way uh, of what I was, not who I try to present to the world in 140 character bursts on Twitter or through Facebook updates or through a kind of cultivated curating of who you are through the pictures that you tumble or that you present on a radio show or whatever. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? It was like, I am this. I am this kind of... uh, fearful creature that's something else like there's this i don't know it was a sort of like feeling that alchemy um and yeah and i'm not putting it very well you know well yeah it's, but it was it's, a feeling yeah yeah um and, and do you do it i would you call yourself spiritual i mean is there is there anything you try to do to get find these sort of moments of no and in fact i just mean sort like, of happened yeah oh that just completely happened um but but there isn't anything say, regular you do to try to 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 kind of disassociate not, yourself from your ego or or from uh, no i don't really even meditate that much i i i aspire to i i always kind <laughs> of uh, every summer i feel like i should go to a meditation retreat um because i think it's worthwhile um in recent years i've started running and sometimes that's kind of a nice way to sort of get outside yourself uh but in that mo, I think what I did was maybe I put myself in the world. I think like what that kind of answered was a question that I had that maybe I hadn't phrased as a question so much was in that travel to Bali, it was sort of like, why travel? It was kind of a referendum on not why travel in the bigger sense for everybody, but for me, why should Jonathan Goldstein travel when in fact he is so often in his own head with his head up his ass? Um, what's the point of all the effort you know, the, the, the travel time and the planning and the money. And, you know, if you're not going to be able to actually be there in the moment and experience it. And uh, that kind of answered the question, you know. And there was a few things that, like, did answer. Like, when you kind of put yourself in out into the world, not on the Internet, but out into the world where actual random occurrences can happen, you know. Like, when I was uh, in the airport getting on the airplane and I wanted something to read and I picked up a book of, uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing him right, uh, 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 Jorge uh, Luis, uh, Louis Borges. You know, he wrote this book, um, uh, Labyrinths. Right. And um, I loved it. And I felt like this was a writer I really related to, you know, and uh, and um I wouldn't have discovered it had I not traveled all the way to the other side of the world and been in this airport bookstore or whatever, you know? Right. So it was sort of like, that's why you need to get out of the house. That's why you need not just to and make yourself pick uncomfortable. up books. Yeah, it's to meet new people and, you know, and uh, and to be a little off balance, I guess, you know? How did you actually end up on, on This American Life? So you were a struggling writer for many, many years. You go to the, the creative writing program. Yeah. So then what was your... Big break. Did you just start getting published in, in various magazines, or or what was the sequence of events? Um, the sequence of events. It, it actually, now looking back on it, in retrospect, it seemed kind of inevitable because I think there was like almost two paths uh, that happened around the same time that that injured two or even there was like even three things actually. There was like a lot of things that were just pointing towards this American life. One of which was, um, and probably the most instrumental was. Um, um, the then editor of uh, there was a magazine Saturday Night, 
uh, hundreds, hundred year old magazine that doesn't exist anymore. Um, Canadian institution. And, uh, I think off of the broken pencil thing, I think like, was it off of that? I don't remember what it was, but like one of the editors, uh, they were looking for new voices and stuff. And he encouraged me to write something for them. And um, he felt like my voice was compatible. And he was a contributing editor and one of the founders of, like, uh, he kind of helped shape This American Life uh, with uh, with Ira Glass. And um, this is, uh, uh, the editor of the magazine was Paul Tuff. And he, they were looking for a producer, and he kind of felt like my voice was, and at this point I started doing, like, radio stuff too, actually. I was doing more radio essays and things like that. And he... Um, On your he own? Th- no, for the CBC. Like okay. I was getting little little things here and there. So after the N- the uh, MFA, I guess? Or no, no, this was... The, uh, uh, was it around... I'm not very good with time at all. Um, yeah, maybe it was around the time of the MFA. I just then, finished the MFA. Maybe. And then you start getting pieces of, for, for magazines and then getting getting your work published. Yeah. And then, so even on the CBC, you get... Uh, is this when you did the, the summer show? Yes, that's right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. You know about that summer show? I, I've read about it. I don't know what it was actually yeah, about, though. Yeah. Well, it was. Um, well, it was me traveling. Road trip. Uh, uh, road dot trip. It was like the beginning of the internet, kind of, and uh, it was sort of like it seemed like a new fun idea. Like they sent me out into the world, and I was going to file my stories through the internet. Like we were going to use. We were going to have a website. All these things were very new. Like they sent me out with um, a digital camera, which at the time was like the size of a shoebox, and like you put floppy disks into it, and. Um, you could take like maybe two pictures per floppy disk or whatever. Um, the editor, uh, rather the, my producer on that show, also introdu- introduced me to This American Life around the same time. She was like, oh, you should listen to this show. I think you'd like it. In retrospect, like once I started listening to the show, I realized actually how similar my, like w- that it was just kind of a good fit. Like I um, I fit in, well, like I sent them the stuff that I was doing. Having not heard their show um the the those road dot trip episodes i was doing and mm. uh yeah they saw a, a kind of compatibility and they said come come down to new york well interview yeah i went in and i interviewed and uh and uh I, even in retrospect when i think about it, like i don't even know how i got the job because i just remember like i did so many things that later on i learned were such no-nos uh, in terms of like things that they liked. like i was pitching hitchhiking stories which they didn't like um, I don't know, but I think they just, I guess they saw something in me. And I think like that was that thing, you know what I mean? That kind of like hope that I was talking about of like that someone would like see a diamond in the rough. And I think they did. And it's wonderful. It's lucky to have, uh, to have people like that, you know, that care or that see something in you that you don't even like you're hoping is there that you don't even know is there, you know? So I, it's a, it sort of finally happened, I guess, in a profound sense, uh, someone actually seeing something in, in your work. Yeah. 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 And to connect, like the, the wonderful thing about going to work at This American Life was also like meeting all these people who I loved. I loved them from the radio and uh, and then I ended up really feeling a great kinship with them. I felt like really very um, lucky, like just really like, what the hell am I doing here? Like these people were, you know, working at Harper's and this and that. And, you yeah. know, I was like this guy from Canada who was telemarketing, you know? Yeah. And I think they felt like, who the hell is this guy for a long time? You know, for like months that I was working there, they kind of like, I remember one of them said to me, like, they didn't even understand why I was hired. Because I seemed like so, like, I wasn't as, I wasn't as um, uh, obvious a fit as they were. Like, these were really smart people. They were uh, good editors and smart, just smart, and capable. And I was kind of a weirdo, you know, and it was only, I think, like once I was given a chance to write my own stories for the show, I think that's when I started to like our Ira really created a space for me. Like he was very encouraging of my uh, writing for the show. And once that started to happen, I think they the other producers started to get it. They were like, oh, OK, I see. Like, you know, I, I had a, a unique, I guess, or a, 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 a different kind of voice and uh and yeah. So, so do you ever find it, I mean, here you were, at, you know, uh, throughout your 20s, struggling so much to get into anything, into yeah. zines. And, and here you are, as one of, you have one of the most popular podcasts for, for the CBC, and you've worked for all these well-known institutes, like This American Life, yeah. and, you know, New York Times and, and National Post. And I mean, it, it, 
it must seem unreal uh, on the one hand to pe- people must come up to you and and first na- of all no one comes up to me really no one puts you on a pedestal like no not really i mean no no i i wish i mean because when I maybe think, it's for the better yeah. that they don't, I'd probably be insufferable. Um, but no, I mean, I think like I'm always kind of like just thinking about uh, how am I going to do this next column? Like I'm obsessive, you know what I mean? Like I number each column that I send each week and I'm at number 200 and f- I just delivered 249 and I never miss a week. You know what I mean? So I'm like always, I think just kind of, um, maybe a little fearful about what am I going to like it's just a I don't know I guess it's just about like hoping to be able to get the job done right so you and still not, don't feel that comfortable you don't feel like I don't, you can I, rest like, on your laurels arrived? Or... no absolutely not no I always feel like I hope this next piece that I do for This American Life will please them I hope because they're my favorite audience you know yeah. like it's wonderful when you have editors or producers that you want to impress you want to make them laugh and you want to uh, you know so you want that next one to be good and um i don't know i guess that's it maybe like if it happened you know maybe if there was no broken pencil and there was no this and that and like this chain of things that would lead to that last thing in the chain maybe then it would seem like overwhelming but i guess like you it happens as you're ready for it you know so it all seems kind of like you're you're comfortable with it more or less right you know and also it's all very theoretical like you know i don't have people coming up to me like i do feel like i live in this bubble like i you know, I um, I don't. Maybe it would be different if I lived in Toronto too. Like I go to the CBC and it's like a theme park of radio. It's like these huge, like three-story posters of the radio show hosts. I'm not right. up on there, and I mean, if I had to walk through that building, maybe it would make me feel self-conscious yeah. about what I was doing to earn that poster. But you know, I kind of like scamper into the side door of the CBC building with my tail between my legs and like leave with my you know chin touching my chest. Right. You know, beside the uh, dangling the my three briefcase. meter Gian Gameshi poster. Yeah, that's right. And I kind of like that. Um, there's a little enclave of English radio in, in CBC Montreal, and it just, no one, you know, I see the, my producer who I work with every week, and uh, I don't have lunch with everybody else in the lunchroom, and, uh, but I love saying hi to them in the halls and hearing about, you know, whatever, their lives. And, uh, and that's it. The world of it is pretty small, and it's theoretical. Theoretically, people are listening to it, but I, I get a little bit of feedback. I like being on Twitter because that's f- fun i like being able to in little increments being able to um hear about it and and to know that to people are actually people. listening or, yeah, yeah 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 and i think that's very important but i there's not a ton of it you know it's all it's pretty theoretical like i know my folks listen to it and even the way they listen to it i've once listened to the show with them because i happen to be at their house and you know in the midst of it my father will stub his toe and my mother will like run around the house looking for band-aids and won't right. be able to find band-aids and they'll get into an argument and you know and that's how it's listened to and something that's that you fine. you you know crafted very carefully with all the ums and ahs and exactly yeah. yeah and that's and that's how it's and that's you know and that's that's life you know hey, and, and you so you keep creating or writing or, or or doing these things even if no one was listening I probably would, yeah, and maybe that's crazy. But, you know, they say that, you know, if you even have an audience of one person, it's worth writing a book, and I, I, I believe that. So you want the people from This American Life to like your work, for example. Yeah. But you don't, do you feel the, the need to try to change it into something they'll like? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I, I trust their judgment. Like, I trust their editing. I, I kind of do trust that they're going to make something better. Uh, it's nice when you're kind of like when you have people that are kind of like have the same taste and sensibility as you do, but have a little bit of objectivity too. Um, but like I said, like I, I I would like to do something that is also not at the expense of other, you know, broadcasty sort of stuff. Like do something that is weird and personal, and you know, do that kind of thing too. You know, I hope to continue to try new things and and keep it interesting for myself and I feel like and my producer and um, and I feel like we've been pretty successful with that I think you know we had a fun season and it was an, it was the eighth season you know and uh, there's still a lot of things that we want to try I think so as long as you keep changing things up and, and exploring different ways of, of, of expressing I think there'll always be new things I think as long as I continue to you know read new books and meet new people and you know there'll always be new things to uh, to, to do There'll always be a new idea. You know, here I'm saying about, like, jinxing it. You know, maybe I shouldn't be saying that. But I kind of feel like, yeah, you know.
there'll, there'll always there'll always be curiosity and want to continue to explore all kinds of different things. Jonathan Goldstein, thanks so much. Well, thank you. For your time. Well, that was my conversation with the host of CBC Radio's Wiretap, Jonathan Goldstein. That's all the time we have for Broadcasting Canada this week. To find out more about the show, you can find us online at broadcastingcanada.com. And there you can listen to other interviews we've done with CBC hosts, ranging from Stuart McLean and Sheila Rogers to David Suzuki and Michael Enright. You can also subscribe to the Broadcasting Canada podcast on iTunes. And if you could write us a review or give us a rating, we'd really appreciate it. Broadcasting Canada was made for CIUT at the University of Toronto. Thanks to CIUT station manager Ken Stauer, as well as Eric Bethlehem. And final word as always, so what is it like to be a Canadian broadcaster? I feel like a lot of that time is given up trying to prove my own normality to complete strangers. See you next time on Broadcasting Canada.